there's going to be a there's going to be a blank space on the recording that we're going to edit out so that we can basically do the before and then a break and then after. Um, Rick Kress is unable to join us today, and so I was voluntold that uh, I needed to come in and help lead, lead the festivities. So um, I'm Bob Alexander, and um, from Angela Hospice, and it's a pleasure to be here among friends. I'm glad that you were able to make time for it, and even if those of you are coming after the fact and watching the recording, or maybe what we're doing is we're experiencing it and then coming back and watching the recording later to reinforce the things that we learned. Um, I will say this, uh, we've got a couple of housekeeping notes uh, to sort of bring to your attention. One is that we generally are planning to mute everybody in the conference call. Um, so if you need to speak, then you'll have to unmute yourself before that happens. Um, when we're sharing the screen, um, when the, the main screen is being shared, I mean, this is standard operating Zoom procedures. You can control who you're watching in the view um, part on the top of your screen. So feel free to play with that all you want if you get bored or you just want to change whatever it is that, uh, that you're uh, watching. Let's keep you, keep you alert and engaged. Um, we are, uh, we're going to have, uh, this, to me, this is one of the, one of the more interesting, well, they're all interesting, but this is one that's really kind of, you know, hands-on, kind of roll up your sleeves and have a dialogue here. I find this to be extremely enlightening. And we're going to have the, uh, some case scenarios presented, and then we're going to go into breakout groups to talk about them. And then we're going to come back and basically report out from our breakout groups what we had. If you have questions while we're in the middle of all this thing, feel free to um, go and put them into the chat section. I'm hoping to keep an eye on the chat and maybe bring up those questions at the opportune or the pre pre-designated moment. So um, I'm hopeful that uh, that'll work. So that's kind of a way of calling attention. I'll try real hard to, to look at the chat. If I'm not paying attention and you've written something in the chat and I'm not reading it, then I encourage you to just stand up and jump up and down. That way there'll be a lot of action in your square and I'll go like, oh, there's something going on. So see how, how important it is for you to be noticed. Um, right off the bat here, I want to thank our sponsor and introduce, um, let's see, Eric uh, Kassebaum from Northwestern Mutual, who is uh, speaking on behalf of Northwestern. And Eric, you get to unmute yourself. Oh, no, you're already unmuted. Please tell us something about you. Lori's, uh, Lori's always taking care of us, so we don't have to worry. Um, but uh, so I'm Eric Casabon, and also in one of those squares on the screen, you guys can see uh, Ken Hummel as well, now unmuted. Um, but uh, no, thanks, Lori, for, uh, for inviting us to sponsor. And, uh, we have, like, like you said, we've heard good things about the uh, learning experience and different things that we'll be able to learn today. But uh, really just thank, you know, thank everybody on the call. Everybody's fighting to slow, um, you know, slow people down and have them really think about their, their finances long term and the, the impact they can make. It's, uh, it really is... Kenny and I notice it just as people figure out their charitable giving strategies, it really just increases their retirement satisfaction. So um, everybody is excited. Some people are excited to give a little bit of money to their kids, but but by all means, if they're giving money to different charitable uh, places, they they tend to be much happier with their retirement. So it's just you know fighting that fight to slow people down and. and and have them understand their goals and what they're trying to accomplish. And of course, you guys giving them some options. So big thank you to all the, all the group for, uh, for fighting that fight and helping those, helping those folks out. But I don't know what the stats, you guys probably know way more than we do, but just the amount of wealth that's being transferred year by year, it's way higher than it's ever been in history for sure. And making sure that goes to the right, to the right spot. So what, uh, what else, Mr. Hummel? No, oh, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. I just going to say that we we typically joke with our clients that as much as we as much as we like the IRS, we'd much rather do a little bit of planning and make sure you know wealth gets passed to the family or or to nonprofits uh, in the local 
local community. It's a lot more exciting for the client and, and a heck of a lot more exciting for us as well. So, uh, so yeah, we appreciate the opportunity to be here, uh, not only to sponsor, but to, to be involved with the workshop. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you both. We really are grateful for your sponsorship and, the, and, and you are, you are preaching to the choir. We are definitely um, engaged and, and know the benefit to uh, donors um, when they are able to be charitable throughout their, their life and beyond. So thank you for helping facilitate that and championing it yourself. Um, I'm hopeful that you all got the attachments in the mail uh, that Lori had sent. Uh, because now we're moving over to Laura Brownfield, who is our resident expert in all matters legislative. You get to be the, uh, the pro on all of that. We really do appreciate the effort and the organization that you put into this. Or you want to take it from here? Tell us what you've got to share with us. Yeah, thank you, Robert. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Ken and Eric, I'm sure you, like a lot of advisors and a lot of the development officers on the phone are probably growing in frustration with the lack of certainty from the Biden administration on what is going to happen with, our, with the tax laws, the proposed increase in the capital gains tax, among others. So I'm here to give you a little bit of an update of what's happened since we last convened. Uh, President Biden's infrastructure plan um, is causing some frustration too in the House. I understand today from what I've read that Nancy Pelosi's meeting with others to consider whether the House should proceed and draft its own tax and spending plan because of the lack of momentum um, in the Senate on its infrastructure plan. And Senator Schumer is pushing forward tomorrow with a vote on the bipartisan infrastructure package, the 500 billion package. We'll see if that actually comes to a vote Republicans are resisting. Other legislation since we last met includes another cannabis bill. And I know many of you on the call, or at least from my experience at the Community Foundation, some agencies have been approached by um, donors who wish to make gifts from funds gleaned from the cannabis industry. So the Senate is expected to remove marijuana from the list of controlled substances, um, perhaps through the bill that was recently introduced by Schumer, Booker, and others, the Cannabis Administration and Opportunity Act. As you know, public sentiment's been growing um, for legalization as many states have moved forward, like Michigan, permitting um, cannabis businesses. So the Senate hopes to enact the legislation by next April, but there is no buy-in yet from the White House. So we'll see what happens. This bill will also incorporate some of the provisions from that Safe Banking Act that we talked about assuring banks that they can work with cannabis businesses and offer basic products like bank accounts um, and loans to cannabis businesses. The ACE Act, I'm sure by now you've all heard about the Accelerating Charitable Efforts Act, which has been met in our sector with a lot more resistance than um, the Senate's who proposed the bill. And they claim it's to reform both private foundations and donor advised funds to ensure that funds get to charities in a reasonable period of time. Of course, from our end, the concern is that changes in the bill are not going to achieve the ends and in fact may discourage giving as the bill proposes to create different types of donor advised funds um, with uh, tax consequences, um, different tax consequences depending on whether the sponsoring charity is a community foundation or a commercial sponsor. And the act also looks to the area that either of those sponsors serves. The act also modifies rules applicable to private foundations, including allowing private foundations to include contributions to donor advised funds as part of their annual minimum payout. So there's resistance, we'll see and follow that legislation and I'll certainly keep you apprised of its progress. I shared with you some recent court opinions. So we talked about the donor disclosure case in California. As all of you know, Michigan does not have a legislative, a state requirement that charities disclose names of donors, but states like California, New Jersey, New York, and others have donor disclosure laws. And the US Supreme Court issued its decision earlier this month, six to three along partisan lines, striking down the law as not narrowly defined enough to carry out the interest of the state in policing charitable fraud. Basically, it's signaling to states you need to find other means, subpoenas, whatever they are, to secure from charities lists of donors because the donor's interest in protecting their privacy, the nonprofit's interest in um, protecting their donors, preventing them from being at risk of harassment, 
or associating with organizations. Um, really, the, don the California's rule was too burdensome on donors associational rights. So the court's message to states is their interest in donor information really needs to be tailored to the wrongdoing rather than simply for ease of administration. Another case of interest is the um, case brought by Asian American students who were denied admission to Harvard. The US Supreme Court has not decided whether it will take it next term, which begins in October, but it sought some advice from the Biden administration on the case. So this is interesting for us as charity because for those of us um, on the call who work with donors who create scholarships, private scholarships, or scholarships through colleges and universities, um, it has implications for charity. And those scholarships, if they include um, race as a criteria, need to conform to, um, the universities need to conform to what the law is. So if the Supreme Court hears this, there's a ch chance it may overturn the Grutter decision. If you remember that, it was the University of Michigan law student who was denied admission and she claimed um, the law school used race as a factor in admissions and it discriminated against her. The Supreme Court found that the University of Michigan Law School had a compelling interest, diversity of student body, in using race as one of many factors. Following that decision, you'll remember we all voted on the Michigan Civil Rights Initiative. Our state, um, now our state law is that undergraduate admissions processes cannot use um, race as a factor. But we will see what happens because these governing laws have a bearing on our public universities and colleges on whether they can accept scholarships with restrictions. There was a federal district court case in California, um, again, where the Fairbairn versus Fidelity Investment case um, arose. So it's another unsuccessful donor advised fund lawsuit by a donor advisor against a commercial sponsor of a donor advised fund. And this is interesting. This donor claimed that Schwab Charitable breached its fiduciary duty by investing the assets that the donor transferred to Schwab Charitable in high fee proprietary mutual funds, arguing basically there could have been lower risk or lower fee funds um, into which the funds could have been invested. And the claim of self-dealing by Schwab, the poor performance of mutual funds really fell on deaf ears. The court said the donor never had any standing to sue, that the donor's advisory privileges, which is all the donor has after he makes that irrevocable gift to charity, did not give him standing to sue. Um, so as soon as he made the gift to receive the tax deduction, that donor relinquished control of his assets and Schwab Charitable was entitled to invest the funds in its own proprietary mutual funds. Last case, because it's somewhat of interest and we were waiting for um, the tax court to come out and issue its opinion in the case of the estate of Michael Jackson. And you see in the numbers I shared with you, the disparate views of what the value of the assets were. This case involved intellectual property. What's the value of Michael Jackson's image and likeness after his death? What is the value of copyrights associated with his music or music he wrote? And um, the IRS, after it reviewed the state tax return, found that the estate undervalued um, the estate and underpaid the IRS 500 million and it assessed another 200 million in penalties and the estate fiduciary said, wait a second, we disagree. Let's take it to tax court. And um, it became an issue of the opinions of the experts, the valuation experts. And this is important because it provides insight not only on valuing assets for trust and estate tax purposes, but it's a reminder to all of us as charities. When we receive non-cash charitable contributions in excess of $5,000, our donors have to um, submit the Form 8283, but also an appraisal prepared by a qualified appraiser. And since these deductions, charitable deductions like estate tax deductions are carefully monitored by the IRS, the donor and us as donees need to rely on qualified appraisers. Um, so some helpful reminders for you and uh, I look forward to seeing you all at the next meeting. Thank you, Robert. Thanks everyone. Thank you very much, Laura. Your, your insights are just so um, kind of valuable. Really do appreciate the research that goes into it and bringing it to us. Makes me feel so much smarter. Um, so, but which that's the point, right? You're trying to make me feel smart. So um, we're ready to move on and into our uh, program for the day. I'm very excited about this because we've done this a couple of times and it always feels so, you know, really fruitful and uh, successful. I'm going to uh, introduce our presenters, uh, the moderators, 
Um, they're people we know and love, but I feel like there um, there might be some surprises in their uh, in their descriptions. If you, if you bear with me, Kathleen Wenzel um, with Salvation Army is a gift planning specialist who educates and encourages people to realize the their dream legacy gift. Uh, after spending nearly three decades working in development and securing six and seven figure gifts, Kathleen believes that building relationships is the key to helping donors fulfill their giving desires. And these are the points that we were making early on um, with Northwestern Mutual. Kathleen has secured various types of gifts, including residential property, life insurance policies, gift annuities, wills, living trusts, and retirement income gifts. Um, she has worked in the community service, education, and healthcare industries. Um, she is an active board member of the Plan Giving Roundtable of Southeast Michigan, where she's the chair of the membership committee. And she serves as a mentor on my beloved mentorship committee, which I have a fondness for, and I really do value your presence and input, Kathleen, your, your cherished there. She's also helped present multiple programs involving case studies to area professionals. She is a certified specialist in plan giving, CSPG, from the American Institute for Philanthropic Studies at California State University, Long Beach, which I think is just such a great credential. And she holds a BA majoring in communications from the University of Michigan, which was my area of study as well. At the university. Um, Kathleen spends some of her leisure time, and if you got on early in the call, you would have heard this, some of her leisure time camping, hiking, and kayaking across the country with her husband of more than 30 years. We're really glad that you've joined us, Kathleen, and are bringing this presentation to us. She is sharing the spotlight with our friend, Alan Tulcher from Wayne State University. Alan's been a senior major gift officer for the Wayne State University School of Medicine since 2018. In this role, he supports the medical school by cultivating friends and alumni, raising funds to support scholarships, research, and the endowment uh, through both major gifts and planned gifts. He was previously with the Salvation Army, a cohort of captains, for eight years, serving Dearborn Heights, Genesee County, Midland, Saginaw, and service extension areas. Um, Alan attended Oakland University, where he received his Bachelor of Science in Human Resource Management, and he previously served as a program chair for the Plan Giving Roundtable of Southeast Michigan, and a very valuable help that he gave us. Alan has the, the, the challenge of in, and the joy of his life at this time, in addition to all of his successes at work. He has three children, ages six, four, and seven months. We've seen them in some calls when you've been had a child in arms. That, that yeah, right in your brow. <laughs> and he resides here where I am, actually, in the lovely city of Livonia. Um, Kathleen and Ellen, thanks so much for uh, leading us in this. Go ahead and take it away. Thank you. So, um, Lori, why don't you share the first case study? And we're going to read through it. And then what we're going to do is break you out into groups. Once you're in that group, you'll remain in that group for the remainder of the day so that uh, you don't have to reintroduce yourself each time you do it. And uh, it gives you a little bit more familiarity with your group. So um, let's give Lori a second. I'm sorry, Kathleen. I thought you were pulling it up. I don't know. Oh, hand okay. It up. Yeah, let's I shared. See. I've given you the ability to share your screen. Nope, that's not the one I want. You'll have to bear with me. I've never done this before, so. We'll wait, all we're three, eminently professional all, and patient. All three pages are there. I think you just need to scroll, Kathleen, right? Yep. I'm scrolling. <laughs> oh. I have two screens. I think that's what the problem is. Hmm. Nobody read this. Yeah. Well, so we are seeing the here we go one plan now. Mm -hmm. Now we're looking at your email. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> yeah. Lucky you. <laughs> All right. Do you see the retirement plan, millionaires? No, no, I mean, no we saw it. The one that you had before was right. correct. Okay, let me move it back. Unfortunately, it doesn't show you what we're seeing. We're seeing something different from what you right. see in your screen. Right. So do you see it now? Yep. Okay, good. So the first scenario is retirement plan millionaires. 
Bob and Mary, both in their late seventies, married after graduation from their alma mater and have worked hard, saving well for retirement. They inform you of the significant portion of their estate. $200,000 in traditional IRA owned by Bob and $500,000 in traditional IRA owned by Mary. $800,000 in Bob's 403B and $700,000 in Mary's 401k from their work careers. $700,000 in a diversified investment portfolio of stocks and other assets. $1.2 million home value with no mortgage. They also inform you that they are considering converting one or both IRAs to a Roth IRA. They tell you their goals are to one, assist their daughter age 50 by providing for extra retirement income for her, assist one of their favorite charities that is currently in a campaign, provide perpetual support for another favorite charity, plan a large gift for their alma mater at their death. What would you recommend? Okay, now what you're going to do is break out into your group and uh, you'll we'll discuss that. We'll come together in 10 minutes and uh, I'm going to ask for volunteers group by group to uh, present their answers. I'm setting up the groups. It's going to take me just one second. I talk, I talk too fast, don't I? No, that's fine. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions before we break out to groups? How long will the breakout be? 10 minutes. Are they currently retired, Kathleen? Yes, they are currently retired. Okay. Oh, look, people are starting to come back. So I'm excited to hear what everybody has come up with. It looks like we're waiting for a couple more people. Lori, are we waiting for a couple more people? The rooms are all closing, so it should be, uh, they should be populating here momentarily. Okay. We have 34 in the main room. Go ahead, Kathleen. All right. Alan, did you want to take over this part of the uh, session? Oh, must be his group that hasn't come back. <laughs> oh, I'm here. Sorry. I, oh, there you go. I was, I was muted. <laughs> I didn't realize I was muted. Um, yeah. So group one, um, what would you do for assisting their one daughter with providing extra retirement income? So Alan is, is disclosure, I'm in group one. Oh, so okay. they had an unfair advantage because I was able to direct them. But Case is going to be our point person for the, the group so that um, he can give uh, different viewpoints. Cool. Hello, everybody. All right. So uh, Alan, are you talking about uh, assisting their one daughter to provide extra retirement income? Correct. So we talked through a couple options and we landed on uh, a deferred CGA or gift annuity. Because she's got time, she's only 50, she hasn't retired yet and it's provided some uh, a time before she retires. Yeah, we kind of had, we had the similar thing. Um, it really just depends on the daughter. If you want to leave a gift of or of cash and she has it, or if you'd like to manage that she's getting income for the remainder of her life, sometimes that's a good thing. If you know your child isn't the best of money managers, that's a great thing to do so you can ensure you have peace of mind that um, they're gonna be taken care of. Uh, anyone else have anything that, any other options they thought would work as well? Well, one of the problems with uh, a CGA is uh, how you're gonna fund it. And uh, you can't fund it uh, necessarily with appreciated assets because uh, your, your new, the new intent is somebody other than the donor, and that would trigger a gain on the creation of the, of the gift annuity. So um, uh, we thought maybe, you know, in lieu of a charitable uh, gift annuity, maybe a, a CRT, a charitable remainder trust with the, her as, the, uh, as a beneficiary. You could uh, clearly uh, avoid capital gains tax on the, or defer capital gains tax used to appreciate property. The other thing we thought about is they can just make annual gifts to her, uh, not, not necessarily charitable, charitable related to charity at all, but they clearly can make annual gifts to her to support her. Anyone else? 
We got our group. We um, one of the things, and and I, and I guess this this probably primarily came from me, but at these people are in their late seventies, and their net worth is slightly under three million dollars. So I'm not sure that they're a candidate to do anything irrevocable with their money that would benefit anybody immediately. Um, the reason why we uh, worded it, Paul, I'm sorry for interrupting. Um, this is not all of their assets. This is just a significant portion of their estate. So, okay, well, Assuming it is a significant portion, um, it's it's still not a lot. I mean, they're a stock market correction, health emergency away from significant downturn. And I guess this is just the cautious estate planner in me, um, but I've, I've seen it happen to a lot of people late in life. And uh, people who were wealthy and all of a sudden died and they didn't have a fraction of what wealth they'd accumulated because of late in life circumstances. Uh, so, um, you know, once again, I, I think that whether they did something irrevocable or not, I think you got to talk to the donors about that and you need to make sure that they're very comfortable with the risk because I think that anybody who, who parts with significant wealth at, 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 with this level of wealth, which I don't consider wealthy, um, is taking a risk. Paul, to, I, I think to address one of the things, or the, the good point you're bringing up, one of the things we had mentioned was the potential of setting up trusts as, as testamentary trusts. Uh, that way, if they needed the assets during their lifetime, uh, they still had access to them. Uh, but if they were to preserve those assets when they passed away, the testamentary trust would meet their needs. Yeah, I would, I would concur with that. I don't, in fact, I couldn't in good conscience recommend anything but a testamentary arrangement, particularly for the daughter. Um, you know, they just don't, they just don't have enough wealth I mean, we might consider them wealthy, but as I said, I've, I've seen too many situations that have gone south um, at this wealth level. I mean, if, we were, if they had $30 million, it'd be an entirely different story. Um, but at less than three, nah, you got to be careful. Alan, I'd like to comment that uh, this is Tina that. Um... I came in a little late, but I was going to suggest perhaps for the daughter a uh, testamentary CGA as an option. Okay. How would you, would, how would, uh, we had that funded, we had a CGA funded through um, cash just off, based off of that they wanted to convert their IRA to a Roth and that would basically prevent and save them on their taxes when they have to convert that as well. So let's go and move on to the next one. Um, what about assisting one of their favorite charities that is currently in a campaign? How about group three? We did talk about that. I think that's us, isn't it, Catherine? Um, we did talk about that. We thought that that might be um, an opportunity for them to use appreciated stock of some kind if they had it. Um, their diversified investment portfolio stock and other assets. We thought that that might be a good source for um, the um, funding some of their uh, campaigns of the charities that they support. And one of the points that uh... I, I know you were going to make was uh, that there's a step up in basis on that. And um, when it goes directly to a charity, you're not assessed any capital gains on that. So that's a good wash for the donor. Right. Thanks for but clarifying. Stay tuned because <laughs> Biden wants to take that away from us. <laughs>
But we uh, we thought maybe uh, we'd use the uh, the IRAs. They have other retirement income or uh, assets. Uh, we thought we'd use the QCD. Um, they each could give a hundred thousand dollars annually, so that's two hundred, and they could essentially use up their IRAs by making those more current gifts um, and also satisfy their required minimum distributions and so forth. So we thought of that as a source for the, uh, the more current giving. Are you said a QCD, what does that stand for again? Pardon? What is a QCD? Oh, it's a qualified charitable distribution. So um, the distribution is made directly from the IRA to the charity um, and each, uh, person has up to a hundred, can do that up to a hundred thousand dollars annually. And it's not included in your income. So it just completely avoids income tax. You don't have to worry about being able to take a tax deduction. Uh, it's just excluded from both federal and state tax that way. Um, and uh, it also uh, can offset any required minimum distribution that, that you're required to take from the, from the IRA. Sorry, I should have specified that. Anyone else on this one? That question. <laughs> well, um, in group seven, we also talked about the fact that if we were going to use a charitable gift annuity, um, that would also be able to benefit uh, if, if we use that to uh, provide an income for the daughter that um, the charity that we wanted to have benefit during the campaign, they would be able to get that pledge for the campaign. They won't receive the assets for quite some time, but they would at least get that pledge uh, that could benefit them during the campaign. I call that a twofer. <laughs> Anyone else? Before we move on to the next part. What about um, providing perpetual support for another favorite charity? Again, I'll, I'll jump on Terry's whole thought of using those um, qualified assets uh, from the IRA to be able to make those $200,000, you know, up to $200,000 a year um, to the charity creating endowment at the charity uh, that will then go on for a longer period of time. Yeah, my group also said using an IRA rollover uh, to make your annual pledge to help with the creating a, an endowed fund over an ex, ex, extended period of time. And we'll move on to the last one. Plan a large gift for their alma mater at their death. Terry, what did you guys have? Well, I mean, following the Paul Hood philosophy here uh, and not making it uh, necessarily irrevocable, I mean, simple, simple bequest or beneficiary designation of a significant gift, they have significant assets. Uh, I mean, we can, you can become more creative if you want, set up a CRT and then have the, have the daughter be the income beneficiary, but all, all done in a testamentary fashion. Um, the only other thought we had was um, a retained life estate um, where you uh, give the remainder of say the house, a home in this case. Now, I, the problem with that I think is that it would create this enormous tax deduction because of the low interest rate. So, it would be so enormous, I'm not sure they could use the tax deduction, but they would potentially avoid capital gain on the home over and above the exclusion amounts. But uh, I know I, we thought uh, just a simple bequest or beneficiary designation, um, it's the simplest way to provide a gift uh, at death. Rob, did you have anything different? Well, uh, nothing different, but just. Uh always remembering that since we've got all those qualified assets that um, if they want their gift to be um, up to the amount of those qualified assets, certainly out of the whole pot there, the first things to think about going to the charity should be those assets in the uh, qualified plans and um, anything to go to their daughter um, should be the brokerage or the home if there was anything that's going to happen. Always think about the qualified funds first um, right. 
which again, as Terry said, so simple with a beneficiary designation. Question, you would do the qualified funds over appreciated stock? For a, um, a gift at death, um, yes, because if the daughter receives the qualified funds, she is going to incur ordinary income as those things are distributed to her and they will have to distribute within a 10 year time period mm -hmm. um, where if she receives the um, stock, uh, she will actually get a step up in cost basis. If she gets the brokerage account, she'll get a step up in cost basis at present. Um, and then we'll only pay if, if she makes gains on those assets as she owns them. Thank you. That might change if Biden has his way, but. Uh, right. <laughs> although, the, although the rule about the ordinary income and the, and the tax from the qualified plans is, would still apply. But uh, if you lose step up, then maybe people will think about giving away capital assets. I think to go back to Paul's earlier point about um, you know making sure that your donors are have enough in their estate to you know care for their life you want to make sure that you're also talking to your donor about you know talking to their team and their their advisors making sure that this will work for them because we don't know everything going on in their life but I'm sure their accountant will also have a better handle on that as well so Always. And of course, they're mass mutual uh, representatives, right? Another plug for our sponsor for today. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> Northwestern Mutual, Rob. Wrong, wrong mutual, mutual company, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> oh, whoa. Sorry, guys. You would like a refund, please? <laughs> <laughs> Any other thoughts on this case? Before we move on to the next one, we've got a few more minutes if you want to discuss any anything about this case any further. Well, I'll just I'll just re I guess more or less reiterate that it's it's in the charitable organization's best interest to look out for the donor's long term best interest because if you don't and you let these people make a gift to you that puts them in financial harms way down the road, you're gonna be dealing with a case of donor's remorse, which is a very real thing. And uh, it might affect the relationship of the organization with the donors down the road. So that's why I know I, I was instrumental in reducing the size of some upfront gifts uh, that were made um, to both the organizations that I worked for because I was uncomfortable with the donors parting with as much of their li liquid wealth as, as they were being talked to about doing. And, uh, and that can put the, the person, you know, put me kind of in a interesting place with respect to my, my colleagues but I truly believe that every step that a development professional takes with respect to a donor has to be measured by, is it in the donor's long-term best interest? And for people whose net worth is at this level, you gotta be really careful about irrevocably parting with substantial uh, or a significant slice of their net worth. Hi, this is Diane. Paul, I agree with you. And I think, um, Diane Gullius, sorry. I, I, I agree with you. I think that what, what you're saying and what I would do in this instance is really encourage them if they have financial advisors, which it looks like they probably do, that this would be a collaborative effort um, that, you know, with, with the, the charity, the development, um, staff and their financial advisors, uh, because then they are getting two different perspectives. So uh, total agreement with you. Anything else? Last call. 
Well, let's move on to the next one then. Kathleen, do you show that on your screen? There you go. All right, let's That's read. the first one, hold on. Sure thing. Here's the second one. Let's read through this. So Evan and Michael, both in their 50s, are successful professionals with a large diversified investment portfolio of stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and other investments. They inform you of the significant portion of their estate, a $5 million in diversified investment portfolio of stocks and other assets, $1.5 mil million for Royal Oak condominium value with 500,000 in their mortgage, 1 million vacation home in the Caribbean with no debt, and 2 million in a traditional IRA that they may consider converting to a Roth in the future. They inform you of their goals, which are the following, provide income for their daughter, Mary, for her retirement years, followed by a gift to a favorite charity, offer support for a campaign of another favorite charity, plan a gift with a vacation home that will still that they still want to use while they can and assist all favorite charities with large gifts at death. So break out in your groups and uh, quick Jeff, question. We'll come back and report. Yeah. Uh, are Evan and Michael married? Yes. Good question. And by in their 50s, are they upper 50s? Let's make them upper 50s. Okay. Okay, welcome back, everyone. I just thought I would clarify that these people were obviously clients of Northwestern Mutual. <laughs> 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 well done, Rob. <laughs> totally redeems himself. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so let's look at um, the first scenario, which is assist their one daughter, age 50, by providing for extra retirement income for her. Um, right, I'm just going to pick somebody. Go ahead, Ellen. Sorry, she's just saying she's age 30, not 50. The daughter, that is, right? Oh, did I say they're 50? Yeah. They're, they're in their 50s. I they're don't know. in their 50s. The daughter's 30. Yeah, she's 30. I'm sorry. <coughs> That's a mistype. And kids young. <laughs> really young. <laughs> they're eight years old. <laughs> All right. Anyway, uh, does anybody have an answer for that? Oh, I'm going to start picking out groups. Well, we we thought right away that it's alluding to um, a gift annuity. Meaning it, it would have to be deferred because she's only 30. Most charities won't even start making gift annuities to people in their 30s. So we thought defer it out to 65 and put to 65, and then it'll start making payments to her. And then when she passes, the, the gift will go to charity. But I have a question about on that one. How concerned are you at the length of the de period of deferral? Because it worries me a bit. 35 years plus her retirement period of time, which you have to assume would be another additional 15 to maybe 20 or more years. She's going to be receiving that's this. A, that's a whole I, lot of time. That's, that's a mighty long deferral. <laughs> Okay, Although so Miriam, what was your suggestion? Well, I mean, we talked about a deferred gift annuity, but then I kind of backed up yeah. because I just worried about, you know, I thought maybe, maybe a CRT might have a little bit more of a plus to it, something that, that could be a bit more, more stable, a, a, a charitable remainder what did we say? We said a unit trust, didn't a we, Bill? Trust. Right, exactly. Yeah. I, I I do think with the deferred gift annuity, though, even though it's deferred out thirty years, uh, properly managed over that thirty-year period, the value of the assets in the annuity would would grow. So that, so ultimately, the, the the benefit to the nonprofit, even though deferred, 
uh, the payments would stay the same. Well, depending on how they set it up. Yeah. But the, the, I, I think you would wind up potentially with a larger gift than what they initially gifted into the annuity. I agree with that, Dennis. I agree. Yeah. Yep. So let's hear from the attorneys. <laughs> <laughs> well, with a charitable gift annuity, theoretically, you can use the funds. You have to obviously set up a reserve for the annuity, but there's a charitable aspect to it. Not to, Most people don't use the funds, but they could use the funds. With a charitable remainder trust, it's in trust, you never get them until after the trust is terminated, but potentially could use the funds in the interim. Risky, but possible. Anybody else? Well, the bullet point said that the, that the, the income was for her retirement years followed by a gift to a favorite charity. So there was a delay for the, the gift to the charity. So hypothetically, Bob, the charity, let's assume Angela Hospice, okay? Yes. Would, if this played out with a deferred gift annuity, that charity, Angela Hospice, quite possibly could receive these appreciated assets in this deferred gift annuity. I don't know, 45 to 50 years hence? Is that what we're talking about? Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, better. Better be a stable charity with a, uh, with a good future. That, that's what my thought is too. I mean, really, there's got to be a lot of thinking before you choose which charity or how you how that charity benefits. Yeah. Yeah. But the gift officer gets again. to book it today. And then leave town. And then leave town, go to, go to his own island in the Caribbean. <laughs> you guys are just incorrigible. <laughs> we are playing devil, devil's advocate here though also yes you're taking a risk on having to wait 35 45 whatever years uh but if something tragic were to happen to the daughter uh prior to her retirement the the nonprofit could receive the annuity gift much sooner yes it could you're such an optimist dennis <laughs> <laughs> you have people that work for you dennis is that what the deal is <laughs> somebody just shared something in chat. I wanted to read that. Susan we did. currently have one of those that originated back in the 70s with many years still to go. Wow. It'll be here soon. <laughs> That's amazing. Any other questions, comments? All right, the next point. Um, offer support for the campaign of another favorite charity. Well, I think you use the appreciated assets here. I mean, uh, the IRA money is not available uh, because they're under 59 and a half. Yeah. So you can't really make any withdrawals from the IRA money. Um, and then you, the rest of it's in real estate. So uh, you give the, give the stock. That's what you, you need do. to give the stock. Right? I agree with that. Yeah. And since they have so much, they really need to unload some of that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, right, exactly. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, you know, five million in stock and assets, they should be, even though, you know, you're looking out for your future and for the daughter, but they still should be making some gifts on an annual basis right. now or paying a pledge or something. And that might be an excellent opportunity to talk with the financial planner about how to put this plan into action so that they are able to make gifts now. Right, right. I mean, they, they have the charity that's running a campaign. That seems to me to call for a current gift that could come out of that considerable uh, stock portfolio. Yeah. Good thoughts. All right. Um, Plan a gift with the vacation home that will that they still want to use while they can. A retained life estate. And that's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Yeah. Thank However, it came up in our group that perhaps how do they know the daughter? We don't know if the daughter may want the home. Yep, that's something to consider. We we, we are. Oh, Paul, we can't hear you. You're muted. 
you know, we, we were also discussing some of the hazards of it being a foreign asset. That's right. Yeah. Can they put can they put a, a foreign asset into a trust? And depends then they... on, depends on the law of the country in which the property is in, situated. Okay. Okay. But isn't isn't it Puerto Rico or somewhere? That's a U.S. possession. Caribbean. It's, it's a Caribbean, and that's a foreign yeah. country. I think that's they the first thing Paul got to determine: is is it in U.S. territory, someplace in the Caribbean, or is it in a other countries property. right 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 because right. some of the other countries you you know you can't be owning a lot of property and stuff exactly or they right. limit out they limit what you can do with it particularly if you're right. not a citizen right <clears throat> sometimes they put uh, uh term limitations of a number of years to be able to have a contract on the property and after that it reverts back to the government Linda yeah, I agree. had an interesting idea about um, taking the property and then renting it out through Airbnb as an uh, income producing asset for the university or whatever <laughs> charity. Wow. Great. How creative, Alan. <laughs> Linda came up with that one in our group. Kudos to, to all of you who thought that way. <laughs> you kids. Only thing you need an endowment for maintenance costs and cleanup right. and insurance. That's right. <laughs> Not to mention convincing uh, the charity that uh, they want to hold an asset that's right. uh, in a foreign country that uh, has different <laughs> occupants each week. Right. Right. <laughs> that's exactly right, Rob. <laughs> How do you do that? Yeah, he, I, I think uh, he, I would take some convincing. I don't think I'd want to do that if I was the charity. I want to volunteer his own work. I would think if you went the Airbnb method, you would want the, the donors to hold on to it and manage that themselves uh, and use the proceeds for a gift or whatever as a, as a charity. I think uh, running an Airbnb would subject you to unrelated business tax. Absolutely. That's right. As well as liability. Yeah, I was just going to say yes. countless liability. Countless. Yeah, you'd have to sell that one to the charity. Or like a, salt, like a uh, song and dance routine. Bob, you could do that, right? I was going to say, Bob has his <laughs> own. The, pro the producers will make a make a, 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 a dance, a musical out of it. <laughs> oh my God! Any other answers to that question? Anybody else have a different idea? Let's move on. Um, assist all favorite charities with large gifts at death, and then I sent out, and then Lori sent out the response to everyone that we've decided that there's five charities. Boy, nobody's giving to charity. Wow. Uh, we thought we'd make it simple. We just, uh, you know, they could have a bequest or beneficiary designations of the IRA account. Uh, right. Following uh, the advice of Rob McGregor, you'd use up the uh, ordinary income asset first in the bequest. So you'd use the IRA money first and leave the, uh, the stock to get stepped up for the the other errors, but uh, you know, use the uh, error money through a beneficiary designation for a, a bequest, and uh, that's how we split up the, the gifts to the five charities. Maybe tell me where I'm really messed up, but this one, when I looked at it, I thought, um, it, it, assuming that Evan and Michael are uh, healthy and such, that um, maybe an insurance, um, insurance beneficiary designation might be an option. Is that yeah. is that false thinking? Is that bad thinking? No, no I don't see anybody challenging me. I, I felt like that, of all of these scenarios, that one felt like the one that could possibly benefit from that, so that um, strategy. Good thought. Yeah, if they're insurable, um, yeah, that that is a, I think that's a very viable possibility. Why is everyone um, trying to convert a traditional IRA to a Roth IRA? What, what are the gift implications of that? I've noticed that in both scenarios. When you convert it, you are going to owe taxes on whatever is not taxed. So potentially you can make a gift of cash and then that will take off your tax liability. 
you'll have tax savings off of what you're already going to be paying through that tax bill, potentially. I think that's why it might have been that. Just my hunch. Could be a tax tax reform play. Maybe they thought taxes might be going up in the future, so they just wanted to pay the taxes now, potentially. Yeah, I think, the, I think the Roth is often discussed, but not as not nearly as often done because you do have to pay substantial um, taxes up front when you convert it. I mean, the benefit is that all the appreciation later is not taxed, but you've got to assume that it's going to appreciate. And mm -hmm. as you know, property doesn't always appreciate in value. I mean, we assume too often that it does. But I can tell you this, there's a hell of a lot of people in this country that own commercial real estate that are looking at this COVID thing and wondering whether their real estate that they always counted on appreciating is going to continue to even be valuable, much less appreciate. Absolutely. One thing about uh, the conversion uh, con conversation that they're, they're, they're thinking of um, is that they, again, they're relatively young, so they could do it in increments that are possibly more manageable rather than converting a whole large amount, depending on what their other mm -hmm. tax liabilities are, what bracket they're in, that conceivably they could do it in, in over, over time and therefore mm -hmm. then sort of gradually move over to Roth instead of incurring like a big loss. Uh, and if they wanted to do it in one lump sum, you could you could spread the tax liability over a two year period of time. So that would that would uh, ameliorate the the pain, at least uh, with the first hit. So. And if you were going to do it in one lump sum, you'd want to be unemployed or have something where your tax bracket drops, right? Would be lower. You want the most advantageous position. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And to answer your original question, why is everybody converting to a Roth? That's one of the things we did intentionally because we wanted you to think about that. Um, you know, our, our group decided that a Roth would not be a good idea for the, the couple in their 70s. But in case, correct me if I'm wrong, but that is a more viable opportunity now that we're talking about the second scenario where the couple's a little younger and there's more, more uh, uh, advantage to them doing it as opposed to the 70 year old couple. So yeah, it was a way to give people the opportunity to talk about it. And it was a good conversation starter for sure. Okay, any other questions? All right, I'm going to share the screen. Now we're going to talk about Prudent Mary. Can you all see the screen? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay, Mary is now 80. She is a retired nurse and she's never been married. She informs you of the significant portion of her estate. $2 million in a diversified investment portfolio of stocks and other assets. $800,000 home, no mortgage, next door to a church that could use the property for expansion. $300,000 in a traditional IRA. She informs you her goals are live in her home where she grew up as long as possible, but with an ultimate gift of the home to a favorite charity. Additional retirement income followed by a gift to another favorite charity. Create a perpetual fund for a third favorite charity. Support the fundraising campaign for two of these three charities. What would you recommend? And now we break. I think all the chickens have come home to roost. <laughs> we populated here. Well, there might be one more room out there that's not back. They're waiting for about six. Yeah. That looks like it, Alan. 
All right, so let's dig in. So, Miss Prudent Mary, she wants to live in her home where she grew up as long as possible, but with an ultimate gift of the home to her favorite charity. What say you? Is the church her favorite charity? Has that been established? It has not been established, but I'm assuming since that tidbit of that it's next door to the to her house, I would assume that is her favorite charity because um, that kind of makes it a much easier decision. <laughs> but it certainly is a good question to ask her. Right. Yeah. We assume so as well, but... So let's go ahead and say yes. Her church is her favorite charity after discussing this with her. How does that change things? So then a retained life estate gift would be um, appropriate in this instance. Yep. But it was so easy, we thought maybe it's a trick question. <laughs> Very good, Carol. <laughs> well, I'm, well, if it wasn't, it might change things, though. For example, um, in my in my old employer, where Kathleen currently is, I think one of our rules, or we kind of would stick to, we didn't want to accept property that was too far off from where we were. Otherwise, it was a liability. <laughs> Especially I mean, for, for a good long amount of time, we weren't taking even taking properties like in Detroit because they were just too hard to unload. So, but in this case, it's very nice because you can either demolish it and expand or you can use it. For example, these people can now house their pastor in there for free if they would like. So Alan, am I to, am I to believe that you did not um, take any of these um Timeshare condos that were on the <laughs> Thankfully, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, that does, it's a good question that like, the, there are like acceptance policies for life estates and it's always before you can give an answer, you have to make sure that they, they line up with what your organization's policy is, so. It's a good thing. We discussed the, probably the, the better route, I mean, obviously the life estate is the, op the obvious choice, but a trust might be preferable in this situation uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, it's more flexible. I mean, she's not a particularly wealthy person, and if the property was put in trust and something happened to her, you know, cause she's 80, but she's got a life expectancy of probably eight or nine years down the road. If something happened to her and she could no longer live there, I mean, she would have living expenses that she wouldn't have the asset to help pay for. But if it's in trust, the trust could sell the real estate and in, in the end help her out more than her actuarial temporal share of the value of the sold property. Because that's all she would get if, let's say, the life estate, if something happened to her at 85 and she could no longer live in the house and said, well, let's terminate the remainder interest life estate gift arrangement. She would get the present value of her remaining life interest. And that's not going to be very much at 85. But if the property, if the capital, uh, if the capital is sold inside the trust, now obviously the trust would owe whatever tax income tax, but if she needed more than her share, the trust, I mean, if I was her lawyer, I wouldn't go for the life estate gift for that reason to protect her down the road. So that's why our group thought that a trust was a better arrangement, even though the life estate is, is so obvious an idea. 
I like the way you're thinking. It's definitely that whole, you know, keep your donor at the forefront of your thought process. Right. We've, we've thought in our group that you could just simply uh, be a bequest of the real estate. You'd obviously be able to live in it and use it. And if she had to sell, right. uh, she'd sell it, but um, simply just a simple bequest of the real estate. Then the, the charity would actually have the option of either accepting or not accepting. You can disclaim the gift. If they didn't want to be burdened with any liability or environmental issue or something. True, agree. One of the things our group discussed regarding her um, apparently seemingly seeking income, but we didn't know um, if she received any kind of social security and if, if not to, or not necessarily if not, but to certainly clarify that during the discussion and ask her to see if that was another stream of income that she currently had in light of the fact that she's seeking another uh, stream of income. Anyone else, anything left on that one otherwise? Let's move on. Uh, the additional retirement income followed by a gift to another favorite charity. A CGA for her to get the income and with her age being um, at 80, she would get a good annuity rate for another stream of income. That is what our group also said. Almost verbatim. I would just be concerned about locking up too much of her current asset base um, because of her age. And, um, and that's the, the only downside of the CGA is, um, you know, she now no longer has control of that asset. One of the things that we discussed is delving a little deeper into her other assets and her portfolio because she may have some underperforming assets and she could convert them easily over into a CGA and take the advantage of the better payment. Anyone else on that? Uh, next one, create a perpetual fund for a third favorite charity. Any thoughts, um, Bill? I'll chime in. I'm sorry, I have not chimed in. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, so again, my thought would be I wouldn't want to use all of our IRA assets, but to use a portion of our IRA assets, maybe sort of establish an endowment and then, um, you know, make a pledge of a planned gift. Again, you know, our group was worried. Um, not wanting to commit too much of her current money now for fear that um, she may need it. Okay. Well, Rob, on, on, on the same note, using those assets in the IRA, instead of doing it currently, she, she could set up an endowment naming the nonprofit as a beneficiary of the IRA. Uh, that way she still has as access to the assets if she needs them now, uh, but, but set up that endowment uh, on her passing. Sure, absolutely. Anyone else, anything to add? And last but not least, supporting the fundraising campaigns of two of these three charities. Our Same. group had discussed it perhaps one getting a QCD or splitting the QCD at, and same thing with the stock portfolio, depending on what size gift she was intending to make. Terry, you have any ideas on that one? What did you ask me? Yeah. Oh, um, no, I agree with that. I mean, she has, assuming that she ha is, feels capable of making current charitable gifts because she feels that she's got enough assets. I mean, if you're going to choose an asset to make the gift from, I think it would be the, the, the IRA and use the qualified charitable distribution. So use up that ordinary income asset first um, in making gifts, assuming that she's decided she's capable of making the gifts, um, that she has enough money to be able to do that. So I, I agree with that. Our, that was our idea also. Okay. Oh, 
she's kind of a conundrum because she's wanting income, but she also wants to expend, you know, I mean, it, it's an interesting right. juggle. And I think Paul has made us all afraid of, of dwindling our, our income. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the wanting income now that I realize I pay more attention to the fact that she's 80, maybe she wants the income in case she needs long-term care or pay for some health issues. It's all questions to ask. Home shopping network. <laughs> <laughs> well, if no one has anything else on that one, um, that is all of the case studies that we have for today. Um, we hope you enjoyed this. Uh, we enjoyed doing these. It's fun to kind of chat through them. Um, we look forward to doing them again. If anyone has any questions or would like any input, would like to ask, add any cases to next time, <laughs> we would love your input. We love doing actual things. And uh, one of the things I know this group used to do is we would ask people if they had any challenges in their own career on cases that they have, they can submit them and we can put them forward to case studies next time and work through them. So feel free to submit those to either Lori or myself or Kathleen. We'd be happy to talk through difficult cases next time and come up with actual real life solutions to help you do your job. We really appreciate what you guys have done. I mean, uh, Kathleen Allen, you just, it, it, it just feels so um, tangible sort of having these conversations, I think discussing the scenarios. It sort of moves it a little farther uh, into reality from just the theory of it. And I think that's a really great conversation for us to have as a group. It feels to me like it's really edifying. So I really do appreciate all the work that you put into creating the scenarios, and basically teeing them all up so that we could, we could chew on them and, and discuss them. Really do. It really is valuable, I think, as a, as a group uh, to do that. I want to also thank um, Eric and Ken um, and their uh, great support from Northwestern Mutual and uh, what they've done to facilitate this experience. You guys really have given us a gift by doing just that. I um, also want to thank everybody who's attended and encourage you to complete the evaluation. We actually have a real Starbucks gift card to give away a, a random drawing for those who have completed the the evaluations and it really is helpful to us we do look at them the board looks at them we have a look at the evals to figure out where our strong and where our challenges are um, so really appreciate your taking that effort I want to give you a reminder about the next month's uh, session august 24th at noon talking about death which that's a challenge for a lot of people i work in a hospice so actually i have an advantage because we're talking about it all the time, but I'm just saying it's, it's an interesting conversation. We're gonna have a great uh, presentation by uh, Kimberly Pittman Schultz of uh, Michigan State University, Western States region. So I um, encourage you to be part of that. And uh, with that, I think we're about there. We've got our mentorship meeting that's going to start right as soon as I sign off of here because I can't start two Zooms at once. And I would encourage you to, uh, to if you're a mentor and a mentee, don't go too far away. Use the bathroom and then come on back in. Um, thanks, everybody, for your great attention and your conversation. It's really been valuable. We really cherish it. Have a great, uh, have a great day. Bye, everybody. I wanted to just give a shout out to um, Eric Hornick. He uh, filled out an evaluation and recommended a presenter, and we've actually, we're actually bringing her in, Dr. Dale, in December to present. So we do read your evaluations. Please give us some feedback. Thank you, Eric. Hey, so Eric. And thanks, thanks to uh, thanks, Kathleen. <laughs> and thanks to Eric Casabon and Ken Hummel for sponsoring. Greatly appreciate you. Have a good day, everyone. <laughs>